Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium show. My name is Jessica. I'm the director of the Planetarium, and with me tonight are three of our students. Uh, I will let them all kind of introduce themselves and say hi, and we will start with Jenna. Hi, my name is Jenna, and I'm a graphic design major at UMD. Hi, I'm Brayden. I'm a, I'm a music education major here at UMD. I'm Eli. I'm a physics and astronomy uh, student here at UMD. So um, it is it is February. Happy February, everyone. Happy Groundhog's Day. Anyone have plans to watch the movie later today? Because I totally am. It's tradition. Do it every year or try to do it every year when I remember. Uh, and apparently we're in for six more weeks of winter, which I feel like is expected here in Duluth anyway. I don't know. Does it really mean anything to Minnesotans to hear the groundhog? Yeah. Definitely felt like it, people made much more of a big deal about it when I was down in South Carolina. <laughs> All right, so since we are at the beginning of the month, um, we are going to be doing our What's Up show to take a look at the astronomical events happening in February. Um, as always, if you have any questions throughout the show, you can leave them down in the comments. Eli is going to be keeping an eye on, for, on that and will let me know as questions pop up. Um, and with that, let me get everything up and going and there we go all right so i forgot to change the title slide again that is supposed to be february edition uh we'll just pretend that i didn't forget to do that all right um so as with most of our what's up shows we're going to start off taking a look at what's happening with the moon this month um, so we actually just had our new moon back at the end of January. Uh, so the first phase of the moon that we're going to see this month is coming up on February 8th, which is going to be the first quarter moon. Then about a week after that, on the 16th, we'll have the full moon, which for this month is often called the snow moon or the bear moon. And then at the end of the month, on the 23rd, we will have the third quarter moon. And it turns out, since February is, you know, an extra short month, we actually are not going to see a new moon phase in February. We had it right at the end of January, and we'll see the next one right at the beginning of March. All right, moving on to the planets. We actually have a lot of planets uh, visible in the morning sky this month. Uh, so that's what we're going to start taking a look at. Uh, so we're looking at the, uh, we're looking towards the southeast uh, just before sunrise. So uh, around 6, 6.15 local time. Coming up in the southeast this month, we'll be able to see three planets. You have Venus, Mars, and Mercury, all visible up in the morning sky this month. Um, Mercury is going to be best seen towards the middle of the month, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. Um, Venus and Mars are going to be in a pretty good spot all month long. Uh, Venus is going to be, I think they said about 300 times brighter than Mars is, so Mars might be a little bit more difficult to see, but Venus is going to be shining nice and bright in the early morning sky. Now, if you have a telescope or a pair of binoculars and you take a look at Venus or Mercury through them, you will see, as you're seeing here in the uh, bottom left corner, that Venus and Mercury are actually going to look as if they are going through phases. This month, they'll be uh, coming more and more illuminated, what we call the waxing phases. And uh, if you didn't know, that's because Venus and Mercury do actually go through phases just like the moon does. And that all has to do with how the orbits work out. Since Mercury and Venus are closer to the sun than Earth is, as we see them go around the sun, we actually see different amounts of the planet lit up depending on where it is in its position around the sun. So we can actually watch it go through a full phase cycle. So for this month, they're on this side, and so we're going to see them getting more and more illuminated, which, because that means they're moving on the other side of the sun eventually, uh, they're also going to look smaller and smaller in our sky because of that. 
Um, and fun fact, um, this was one of the major clues that led Galileo and other astronomers to uh, kind of understand and confirm that uh, we live in a sun-centered solar system where the planets go around the sun instead of the planets going around the earth, which is what was thought for a while before that. All right, um, so the best time, as I said, to take a look at Mercury is going to be about mid-month, around the 16th. And that's because on this day, Mercury is reaching its greatest elongation. What that basically means is it is going to be the furthest from the sun in its orbit, which puts it the furthest from the sun in our sky, and therefore makes it easier for us to see. So if you want to try and catch all three of these planets up in the early morning sky, if you're a morning person and are going to be up at 6 a.m., uh, best time to do it is around mid-month. All right, um, now moving to our, I'm just double checking my notes here. Yes, moving towards our, uh, into the evening sky, we have a few more planets that are up, not all easily visible. Um, so we have Jupiter still hanging around for at least the beginning of the month. You can see it very low in the southwestern sky um, just after sunset. Jupiter is, though, gradually moving closer and closer to the sun in our sky, so it's really only going to be visible for the first maybe week, week and a half of this month, and then it's just going to be too close to the sun, and we're not going to be able to see it. In fact, uh, Saturn is already too close to the sun. That's why we're not seeing Saturn in our evening sky anymore. Um, and Saturn's actually going to reach conjunction with the sun on the 4th. That's when it's the closest to the sun from our point of view. Um, now, we also have Uranus and Neptune that are still up in our evening sky. Now, these planets aren't visible to the naked eye, but you can see them if you look through a telescope or a powerful uh, pair of binoculars. Uranus is going to be pretty decently visible um, for most of the kind of evening up till about midnight. You can see it's pretty high in the sky, so once it gets dark enough to find it and see it, you should be able to see it and it should stay there all month long. Um, Neptune is a bit of a different story. You can see that it's pretty close to Jupiter down on the horizon, which is going to make it difficult to try and find because by the time it gets dark enough to really see it well, it's going to be sitting very low on the horizon. So if you want to give it a shot, uh, your best bet is to try and do it during this first week, week and a half of the month, because after that, it's going to be very low on the horizon and almost impossible to try and find and see. All right, so those are our planets. Uh, moving on to the International Space Station, um, which is, uh, of course, something that you can easily see in the sky if you know when and where to look. Now, a couple of notes when looking for the International Space Station in the sky, or really any satellite in the sky, um, it's important to know what you're going to be looking for. And so down in the bottom right, we have kind of an animation uh, that shows what, it, what a satellite appears to look like for us here on the ground. And what you're going to see is this light that steadily moves across the sky and will briefly get a little brighter before dimming off again. And so it's a gradual kind of bright and the dim that's different than a blinking light. A blinking light's going to be an airplane. So you're looking for that steady, constant light moving across the sky. Um, so a great way to kind of check and see if and when you can see the International Space Station is the website heavens-above.com. Um, you put in your location, you click ISS, and it tells you what's your, uh, when you can see it for where you're at. So I've done this for us here in Duluth. Um, so you can see we have a couple of evening passes happening the first few days of the month. And then later in the month, we're gonna start seeing some early morning passes. You can see that with the, the time here. When looking for uh, a good date to choose, when you wanna look at what time 
I prefer the evening passes because I'm more likely to be up then. I am not usually up at five, six o'clock in the morning unless I just haven't gone to bed yet, which can happen. I am self-admittedly a night owl. I will do that sometimes. Um, but you're going to want to look for the date that has the, the, the time period that you're going to be outside. And then the other thing you want to look at is the brightness. So the brightness value is in magnitudes. And the magnitude system can be a little confusing for people who aren't used to it because it's, it's backwards. The way it works is the smaller the number, the brighter the object. So to find a good pass of the ISS, ideally you want to try and look at the brightest, which is going to be the smallest magnitude number. So for example, um, I pulled up um, one of these evening ones. Uh, we had one earlier tonight that was been really good, but that was before that we, before we streamed. Um, so on the fourth, we have a, a decently bright pass of magnitude negative 2.2. Um, so if you find a pass that you want more information on, you can click on that date and it'll send you to a new page, which will give you all the information on the exact timings and will show you a map of the sky so that you can know exactly where to look to find the ISS. Now, Heavens Above um, will do all of this for you. And in fact, you can get information on other satellites as well if you're interested in trying to find more than just the International Space Station. Okay, um, so on to some news updates. Um, we have, of course, a really exciting chance for some aurora happening tonight. Back on uh, January 30th, the sun released a coronal mass ejection, or a CME. This is a huge burst of uh, charged particles that comes off of the sun. And this one is at least partially heading directly towards us and is expected to hit today. Um, and with that excess uh, or extra stream of charged particles heading our way. That is, of course, what leads to the aurora, to the northern and southern lights. Um, so when you have more of it, the aurora tends to be bigger and brighter and you get more activity. So for anyone who's kind of living in the northern U.S. or just northern um, North Europe, Canada, all of that, uh, you have a very good chance of having some some interesting and some good auroras tonight. Um, for anyone who is not in the area or is just wanting to kind of check out what's going on before maybe heading out yourself, don't forget that we have an all-sky camera up in the very northern Minnesota at the Chickwalk Museum and Nature Center. Uh, you can always go to the website, which is listed in the video description. Uh, to take a look at what the sky is looking like right now. This was from um, back on January 24th, so this one isn't right now. Um, but it'll show you and you'll be able to see if Aurora is happening. And that can give you a good idea, especially if you're in this area, whether you should bundle up and head out. And if you're going to head out tonight, you definitely need to bundle up because it is quite chilly out there today. Um, and then we also, on our uh, the camera's Facebook page, which is also linked in the video description, um, each day we post the time-lapse videos. So for anyone who's not here or maybe missed out, you can always go check the Facebook page tomorrow and see the time-lapse video for tonight and see what sort of Aurora activity we got. Um, this was also from uh, January 24th, um, but this is kind of what it looks like and I always like talking about it and showing this off because this has been a really fun project uh, that I've been a part of and we've gotten some amazing results from it so you can see the little bit of Aurora activity we had back on January 24th. All right and I'll pause it there um, and we'll head into the last bit of news that I want to give everyone tonight and that is updates on James Webb because of course I'm going to talk about James Webb. Um, everything seems to be going really well. Um, it's launched, 
it has unfolded, uh, it has been inserted into its orbit, um, which is at what we call L2 or Lagrange point 2. It's this little spot to the side of the Earth that acts like almost like a little gravitational well. So James Webb is just going to kind of orbit around the sun um, with us as the Earth moves around the sun. But it uh, got it to its orbit uh, back on January, January 24th. Um, it seems to be doing really well. Uh, instruments are starting to turn on. Things are starting to get cooled down to the temperatures they need to be. And they have announced the first target that James Webb is going to look at, which is the star HD 84406. Um, not an exciting name, but it is a star in the constellation of Ursa Major, the Big Bear. And they're going to use this star to help them uh, calibrate all of the instruments. Uh, so what needs to happen is the mirror here on James Webb is actually made up of um, 16, 18, uh, lots of little hexagonal segments. And so what they need to do is look at the star so that they can fine tune the position of all of those little segments so that they act as one complete mirror and not as 16 separate mirrors. So they're gonna look at the star, they're gonna calibrate it, uh, they're gonna calibrate the mirror, then they're gonna start working on calibrating all of the other instruments that are on James Webb. And we are looking at the first kind of public release of kind of the first, first data that it takes in June or July, because um, they're expecting this calibration of the mirror process to ha happen through March and April, um, and then and then yeah, it's gonna it's gonna start taking taking its first data. Um, I oops changed. Uh, I'm still kind of in shock that this is happening, but very excited. So there is your uh, James Webb update from me. All right, well, I think that's about it for our astronomical events and a little bit of um, astro news updates. We don't have a whole lot going on uh, astronomically this month, um, but still got some good chances of looking at the planets and then some other things. Um, there was something else that I was looking into but I wasn't quite sure how to explain to people how to see it. Um, and that's the zodiacal light. So our solar system is full of really lots of just pieces of dust and grains of sand. And that can reflect the sun's light. So occasionally, a couple times a year, if you are in a very, very, very dark location at the right time of year, you can see the sunlight reflecting off of all of the dust that's in our solar system, and that's the, the zodiacal light. Um, the last, I think so the last two weeks of February are like that ideal time frame um, for this time of year, uh, or, or for this, this go around. I think there's also one in the fall. Um, to try and see that, but you have to be in super dark skies to be able to see it. Um, so if anyone is interested in taking a look, that's something that uh, I would suggest you look more into. And I'm kind of curious to see if our camera ends up picking that up later this month. So um, if we do end up seeing it on the All Sky camera, I will probably do either an update on stream and tell you about it, or at least do a post on our Facebook page to uh, to tell you about it. Um, but I uh, will admit I, I don't have a lot of experience with the zodiacal light, so I didn't want to get too in depth with it. All right. Um, so, do we have any questions? Uh, we have one. What do people in the southern hemisphere see at this time of year in terms of aurora? That is a good question. So the um, Southern Hemisphere has their own version of the Aurora. Um, instead of the Northern Lights, it's the Southern Lights. And it is pretty much exactly the same as, as what we see. It's just around, centered around the South Pole rather than around the North Pole. 
Yeah. Uh, we just got one more. We have the North Star in the Northern Hemisphere, but there's no South Star. Therefore, Polaris won't always be our North Star. How many years before Polaris is not at North? Ooh. I don't know an exact... I mean, it's thousands of years. Um, Because I want to say it's still moving a little bit closer to Polaris for a little bit longer, and then it'll start moving away. Yeah. So we have, I would, I would venture three or four thousand years. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question though. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we will hang out a little bit longer to see if there are any other questions. Um, in the meantime, let me tell you what's coming up over the next week. Um, so on Saturday, we are doing our uh, February Constellation show. Where we'll look at the stars and constellations that will be up this month. Uh, next Wednesday, Eli is going to do our uh, How Do We Know show, which takes a look at common things that are kind of just stated as fact that obviously we had to figure out somehow, like the speed of light. Uh, and we'll, um, he'll kind of walk us through uh, and talk about how we figured out these things that we take today as just fact. And then next Saturday, since it is just a couple days from Valentine's, we're going to do our special Love is in the Stars show um, uh, like we did uh, in previous years. And so we'll take a look at some of the more, um, I was going to say relationship, but it's, it's friendship, uh, familiar relationships, and um, relationship, relationship, I can't think of the word. Um, but lots of different constellation stories revolving around different types of relationships. Um, it's a really cute, fun show, and it's family friendly. And so that will be next Saturday. Um, we got one more. Is that thing about the poles switching actually a real thing? Yes, it is. Uh, so the magnetic pole, um, the magnetic north and south pole on the Earth, does flip and north becomes south and south becomes north. We see evidence of that in um, rock samples. Um, the thing is, we don't entirely know the mechanism of how and why that happens. There's also not a steady like time frame over which it happens. It seems to have been, it, it's happened quite a few times in the past, but there's not a, a common kind of time period between the flips. Um, so yes, it's happened. We don't fully know why. We don't know when it's going to happen again. And we don't know what's going to happen to us when it does happen again. So maybe not the most satisfactory answer, but... <laughs> Is the force of gravity the same as it has always been? Yes. I'm, I don't... My initial thought was like, is the force of gravity on Earth the same as it has always been? Um, Which is yes. I think so. I mean... Yeah, so the force of gravity um, that you feel depends on the mass of the objects so in, case, in case of... Uh, the case of us here on the earth that's the mass of the earth um and it just depends on the distance from the center of the object so the distance from the center of the earth um neither of those two things have changed uh so we uh, should be the same um that does mean that if you go up a tall mountain or even a really tall skyscraper the gravity you experience is going to be just a tiny little bit weaker than what you would experience at sea level. Um, but it's a very slight difference and not anything that you would notice. Um, and you wouldn't really notice it until you get pretty far away from the Earth. Um, and then same for the sun. I mean, our the gravity that the sun pulls on the Earth, again, the mass of the sun hasn't changed. Our distance of our orbit hasn't changed. So that's the same. Um, to follow up, they asked, is it a constant? And we elaborated. It's a, on Earth, at least, it's a function of how far you are from the center. So um, for most practical situations, you're standing at the radius of the Earth. So it's pretty constant. But like yeah. just said, if you go up a mountain, 
it's a lot weaker and that's why when you a know, lot little not a lot um that's why <laughs> when you go up a mountain it's um colder and harder to breathe because there's less gas being held down because the gravity is just a teeny bit weaker yep yeah good questions all right um i trying to think if there's anything else to talk about I guess, I guess I can give a little bit of an update on the planetarium itself. Um, since we are currently closed for public and private shows, um, I'm probably going to end up eating my words after I say this, but I we are hoping to be able to open back at least for private shows in March. Um, we have a lot of the technological issues all fixed. We have our new system that we are learning and getting all of the shows remade in um really the defining factor now is watching how uh covid cases are um which fingers crossed seem like we're finally starting to decline um and we're getting out of this latest wave so um yeah once once it is safe to do so we we are pretty much ready to go and very eager to get back open because yeah i keep thinking i mean it's been it'll be two months two not not two months two years in march since we closed except for the brief little time that we we reopened at the end of last year so that's our update all right well i'm not seeing any more questions come in so i think we will wrap it up there Thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. Um, if you liked the show and are interested in other stuff that we have done in the past, you can find all two years worth of our past live streams, either in the video section of our Facebook page or over on our YouTube channel, which is linked in the video description. Um, for the time being, at least through February, we will continue to stream on our regular schedule of Wednesdays and Saturdays at 7 p.m. Central. Um, once we do get to the point that we reopen for public shows, there will be a slight change to that schedule. But uh, once we have the details of that and know for sure when the reopening is gonna be, we'll let you know all of that information. Um, all right, so thank you again. Have a wonderful rest of your evening and we will see you again next time. Bye everyone.